Being single sucks on Valentine's Day. It sucks even harder when you work in an expensive, fine dining establishment on the edge of Boston Common, bussing the tables of happy, doting couples who are fawning over extravagantly plated dishes. You try to ignore their little displays of affection, focusing on your work instead of being consumed by feelings of jealousy and disdain. Don't get me wrong, Number 9 Parks is a great place to work. The tips are killer, but it's still utterly depressing. So on the run-up to this past Valentine's Day, I made myself a little Tinder account, complete with a witty description and a few choice photos. At first, swiping through endless faces was almost as soul-destroying as working a Valentine's shift. Almost every profile either smacked of depression or dripped with vapid arrogance, but I soon found myself matching with a couple of attractive local girls as well as a few out-of-towners studying at Boston University. One girl in particular was simply stunning. Her arms were covered in nautical tattoos, intricately colored octopi and jellyfish, while captivating hazel eyes shined almost as bright as her dyed orange hair. Mary, 27, her profile read, Be my Valentine. Now, as a lot of you may know, you have to have pretty thick skin to use Tinder. Slowly but surely, my matches' replies dropped off as their interest waned. Some even laughed and unmatched me when I said I wouldn't be able to make a Valentine's Day date until after 10.30 p.m. when my shift finished. But Mary never, ever failed to reply, sometimes within seconds of me sending a message. Granted, her responses tend to be monosyllabic, almost shy, but she was seriously enthusiastic about the idea of getting together. She said she got lonely on Valentine's Day, that she needed me to be there for her on that night. Sure, it was unusual for me to get such attention, but as I said, it sucks being single on Valentine's. I met her after work at a little late-night place in Chinatown, the kind of stereotypical Asian place adorned with outdated chinoiserie among a sea of red velvet. She said she liked the garlic noodles there, so I figured it'd be a surefire way of getting her back to my place afterward. Mary was even more beautiful in person albeit with a melancholy look about her as she sat alone at a small table for two, waiting for my arrival. I opened up with an apology, hoping she hadn't been waiting too long. It turned out she was just as shy in real life as she was online. She barely spoke, and when she did, it was just the odd word. I reminded myself that it wasn't exactly charisma that I was looking for, but it didn't matter how shy she was right now, just that I could get her back to my place after a few drinks. We ate in silence, which didn't bother me too much since I was absolutely famished from a long, tiring shift. Occasionally, I would catch her staring at me, her expression blank and emotionless. Any other time, I might have considered it creepy, but let's just say I wasn't quite thinking straight thanks to the prospect of getting laid for the first time in a while. Once we finished, I paid the bill, tipping the Chinese waiter generously. On previous dates, I'd always try and impress the girl in question with a generous tip. Usually, they're pretty impressed by the gesture, associating it with kindness and thoughtfulness. But Marie didn't even react. She just kept staring at me across the table, her gaze unflinching as the waiter reached across the table in front of her. We were walking along Boston Common back towards my apartment when she finally spoke. She asked me if I knew the story of St. Valentine the patron saint who the festival is named after. I remember shaking my head, only too happy to listen to her now that her shyness seemed to have abated. Quietly, in a voice barely above a whisper, she explained that St. Valentine was executed by the Roman Emperor Claudius for marrying Christian couples in secret on the outskirts of Rome. I actually thought this was kind of romantic at the time. I tried to lighten the mood by mentioning just that, but she didn't react. She just carried on with the story. She grew a little more animated as she exclaimed that once Claudius had heard rumors that Christian converts were festering in the city suburbs, he ordered them to be hunted down and punished for their heresy. Praetorian guardsmen, the most loyal of the emperor's soldiers, scoured the city for Christians, horrifically torturing prisoners to extract extensive confessions. One such confession led to the home of a man named Valentine, who, when tortured himself, 
revealed that not only had he pledged fealty to the one true God, but that he was sanctifying marriages of local couples in the name of Christ. Enraged, the Praetorians dragged Valentine into a local square before summoning the townspeople to witness the execution. It was messy, violent, truly horrifying to watch. The Imperial soldier's sword was blunt, in an almost ceremonial addition to his uniform. It reportedly took a long, long time for the soldier to hack off the head of the confessed Christian priest. After he was beheaded, St. Valentine ascended to heaven as a blessed martyr, entered the gates of paradise with his own bloody head cradled delicately in his hands. Kneeling before the gilded throne, St. Valentine presented Christ with his own severed head, a symbol of the pure love and devotion that led to his martyrdom. I was impressed. I had no idea that such a brutal story was behind such a saccharine, cliched holiday. I remember turning to ask her how she knew such a thing, but I was met with a gaze that sent a chill through me. She then told me that she had always wondered what it would be like to be the recipient of that kind of love and devotion, the kind that could lead someone to see their own death as little more than an act of loyalty and worship in service of someone they truly loved. It was at this point that I began to actually feel unsafe around Mary. I have since had friends tell me that I shouldn't have been such a wimp. The girls that are a little crazy tend to be the best in the bedroom. But they can't understand the sense of imminent danger I felt as Mary's hazel eyes were fixed unblinkingly on mine. We carried on walking as I racked my brain for an excuse to get home alone, and I eventually settled on something involving having to be up early for work. I knew the lie didn't work. She didn't say a word to me as I flagged down a cab and helped her into it. I told her I'd call her, but it was like she could smell the untruth. Like this had happened countless times before and she could recognize the pattern. But it didn't end there. She's been following me for weeks. I made a complaint to Boston PD, but the officer taking the report was practically laughing as he wrote it out. No one believes that this girl could be dangerous but you can imagine how terrified I am when I walk out of my apartment building and see a stuffed animal sitting on the porch. The lone Valentine's card sat next to the teddy bear, a message written in some dried, dark fluid. As I open the card, I begin to feel the intense metaphysical sensation of being watched from somewhere. Be my Valentine, it read. The year was 1978. Roman Polanski had recently fled to France after pleading guilty to indecent acts with a minor. Serial murderer Ted Bundy was found and arrested by Florida police. The Hillside Strangler, another killer local to my hometown of Los Angeles, had just claimed yet another victim, found stuffed into the trunk of an orange Datsun. It seemed no coincidence to me that I was turning 18, becoming a woman, just in time for all the evil in the world to rear its ugly head. The peace and love of the 60s were long dead, replaced with envy and lust. It wasn't about smoking to relax anymore, it was about doing coke and fighting, or shooting up to forget the pain of the paradise lost. California was supposed to be the promised land, manifest destiny, but all I could see was corruption, decadence, greed, and death. I know, I was a cynical girl, but those were just the times. Americans had only recently withdrawn from Vietnam. The Watergate scandal was fresh in our memories. People didn't trust the government or each other. There was a big black cloud hanging over the country. No one seemed to be able to escape it. Then I met Rodney. He was tall, tanned, and outrageously handsome. When I first saw him, I legitimately thought he could have been an up-and-coming movie star. Long, coiffed brown hair framed a strong, caramel-toned face with deep brown eyes that seemed to emanate a masculine broodiness. When he told me that, in his deep, smooth voice that he originally hailed from Texas, I almost swooned. I had grown up on cowboy movies, and Rodney seemed to embody that kind of border-town exoticism that I had so romanticized during my youth. I was overjoyed when he asked me out. He was a little older, but that didn't bother me in the least bit. 
He was everything I ever wanted in a man, and it blew my mind that he seemed to be so into little old me. A man like that needed a queen, and if that queen was to be me, then who was I to give it a second thought? It was a Friday night when he picked me up from my parents' house in his old Chevy. My father eyed him suspiciously from the kitchen window as I made my way to his car. I just thought it was sweet. The old man was protective of me, and that just made me feel even more special. And there I was, newly 18, and I had just bagged the hottest guy west of the Mississippi. It was a teenage dream. The first thing he did was apologize for any nasty smells that came from the car. He said he'd hit a deer earlier in the month and still hadn't quite gotten rid of the odor. The only thing I could smell was the rich, heady scent of this cologne with a twinkle in my eye. I told him everything smelled just fine. We drove around for a while, just talking and swapping stories while we cruised all over downtown L.A. He drove us to a quiet little spot on Venice Beach, produced a joint, and we smoked a little before engaging in a long, sensual makeout session. He was a little rough, at one point biting my neck so hard I winced in pain, but it was all just so intoxicating. He was so manly and wonderful. I didn't dare say anything for fear of disappointing him. We arranged another date as he drove me home. I suggested we hit the beach during, but he shrugged off the idea. I tried convincing him to accompany me on a lunch date, but again, he brushed off my suggestion. He only seemed to want to do something in the evening. Nighttime is the right time. I remember him saying as the Chevy idled in the street outside my house. That's when things really happen. When the darkness surrounds everything, when shadows rain. God, he was a poet to me. Yeah, I was naive. Some people might even say plain dumb, but I had never, ever had a guy talk to me like that. Half of the guys at my high school could barely string a sentence together, let alone spin words like pure gold as Rodney did. I must admit I was excited when Rodney picked me up the next week and drove us out to a secluded spot in the pines out near Hidden Springs. I wanted all of his attention, every iota of it. This seemed like the perfect time to get it. We were in another of our heavy makeout sessions when Rodney began to get a little rough again. Gentle, roaming hands began to intrude and prod. I could feel his fingernails raking against my bare skin. It hurt, almost as much as his teeth did when he nearly sank them into my flesh. I tried to tell him to stop, to slow down, but he just growled and silenced me with a kiss so hard it made my lip bleed. I wasn't enjoying it anymore. He wasn't so caring and gentle anymore. I could see another side to Rodney, and I didn't like it at all. Then, before I could even react, his hands were around my throat, squeezing and choking. I'd never been so completely terrified in my entire life. The Rodney I had thought I knew was gone. His eyes were black now, as deep and lifeless as the void. I gasped for air, feeling the life draining from me as that black-eyed devil loomed over me from the driver's seat. My eyes begged him silently to let me go. Just as I was about to pass out, his face seemed to register a kind of guilt or remorse. He panicked and let go of me, leaving me coughing and spluttering for air, clawing at the passenger's door handle. He apologized profusely, telling me he didn't know what came over him. I made him drive me home before telling him that I didn't want to see him anymore. I just couldn't see him in the same way. He frightened the literal life out of me. I thought about going to the cops, but I was embarrassed, ashamed that I had been foolish enough to allow myself to be so mistreated. A few months later, I had almost forgotten about Rodney. I was dating another guy, one not as exciting or mysterious, but one that I knew wouldn't have it in him to put me in such danger. I was sat with my mom watching an old favorite of our shows, The Dating Game, over a couple of TV dinners. Jim Lange wore his trademark Beatles haircut along with those horrible flowery ties he was so insistent on wearing. For those of you that aren't aware of the setup, three mystery bachelors are shown cloaked in shadow before a bachelorette is presented to the audience. The mystery men are then illuminated as she begins to ask them a series of comical questions. This addition, however, made my skin crawl. 
the studio lights came up. And there, I kid you not, was Rodney. The same gorgeous hunk of a man that I had first laid eyes on in that L.A. street. The same man that had nearly strangled me to death in the passenger seat of that old Chevy 69. It made me sick to see how relaxed and cavalier he was, sitting there like he was God's gift, answering all of those poor girls' questions. She couldn't even see him, let alone recognize him for the predator that he was. What's worse, he actually won the show. The bachelorette picked him over the other contestants. Tears filled my eyes. I had to bite my hand to keep my mom from seeing how upset I was. I wanted to get in touch with the girl, to tell her everything that had happened to me, to warn her not to go out with Rodney during the nighttime he seemed to thrive on. But I don't know. Part of me thought he might have changed. Part of me wanted him to have changed so he could once again be the dream guy I had always wanted. But I was wrong. Rodney hadn't changed. He had gotten worse. On June 20th, 1979, a 12-year-old girl named Robin Samso of Huntington Beach was declared missing after failing to show up to a ballet class. Less than two weeks later, her corpse was discovered in the hills that surrounded L.A. Rodney James Alcaca was arrested in connection with her death. It was not the first time Rodney had taken a life. A timeline of events would reveal that at the time I was dating him, Rodney had already murdered five or six young women, often after plying them with marijuana, just as he had done with me. I consider myself a survivor. I don't know what it was about me that made Rodney let go of my throat that evening, what was different about the events that led him to spare my life. Maybe it was that, encased in the shell of a monster, there was a little piece of humanity still left in Rodney's heart. Just as in every decent person, there is a little kernel of evil lying dormant. A small piece of evil just waiting to be woken up. My name is Serge and I'm an independent internet researcher up in the Great White Canadian North. It's normally a pretty boring job. I study online trends for retail companies so they can tailor their algorithms and such. Not the most exciting job in the world, but it pays pretty well. But for the past year or so, I've been putting a lot of professional and spare time into a fairly recent internet phenomenon known colloquially as catfishing. For those who aren't aware, catfishing is a deceptive activity where a person creates a sock puppet presence or fake identity on a social networking service and is often employed for romance scams on dating websites. The practice may be used for financial gain, to compromise a victim in some way, or simply as forms of trolling. The client I've been in the employ of for the past years, one of the larger dating apps that has risen in prominence, in the hopes that my research will prevent the phenomenon from occurring, since fear of becoming a victim has caused their traffic to stagnate over recent years, and understandably so. I've been working on a comprehensive guide to catfishing and how to avoid it, but for now, I'll tell you some stories I've gleaned from interviews with people who have come forward as a result of advertisements I've put up online. These are some of the scariest catfishing stories I've compiled. I interviewed a young woman from the United States who says that she met what seemed like the perfect guy online. They did it for over a year and spent months talking online before they met in person. When they did, she was introduced to his parents, slept in his apartment, met his circle of friends, the works. Then suddenly, one day, he randomly disappeared. The girl, who I'll not name, paid hundreds of dollars to an online private investigator service and after months of research, they discovered something horrifying. The man had given her a false name and had done so to many, many other girls online. But the reason that he had disappeared was that he had been sent to prison on manslaughter charges. One of the other girls that he had been involved with had died as a result of some sort of kinky game that they'd been playing, and he was subsequently tried and convicted of the crime in the federal court. I remember her crying when she said it could have been her, that they had discussed that kind of activity and were only a matter of months from trying it. I spoke to another girl over Skype about her experiences with her catfish. One might assume that most catfish victims are men who are being romantically scammed out of their finances, but... 
It's actually quite untrue. Women and girls seem to be the most susceptible, but this is a so far unsubstantiated conclusion that requires much more evidence and many more examples for me to prove it conclusively. Anyway, the girl I spoke to was in her early 20s, was very petite, and had done some modeling work with the hopes of making it an actual career. When a model who called herself Jasmine reached out to her with some advice regarding the industry, she thought it might have been her big break. Jasmine appeared to be experienced and well-connected and proved to be a constant source of inspiration and motivation for her. They ended up becoming good friends, and when Jasmine clued her into a lingerie shoot that was apparently working for a company based out of Milan, Italy, the girl was incredibly thankful and grateful for such an opportunity. However, when it came to the day of the photo shoot, Jasmine didn't show up. The girl I interviewed was very disappointed, but was assured by her so-called friend that a relative had passed away suddenly. She was alone, but the photographer was friendly and welcoming, and they continued with the shoot as planned. She was paid rather handsomely and actually returned to the studio twice after to do some similar photo shoots. But the last time she did, her attire and theme of the photo shoot didn't sit right with her. She told me it was verging on raunchy, which, if you catch my drift, was unusual, since a lot of the clothes were what she described as innocent-looking. This did raise some suspicion, but again, she was paid generously. Around 18 months afterward, the girl read of a photographer who had been convicted of producing and sharing lewd images of children online that he had used the persona of a fictional girl to lure women into photo shoots and sold the photographs under the pretext that they were of underage girls. Whilst not strictly illegal, it did take long for the photographer to venture into actual illegality, and it was over this that he was convicted of a crime. She felt sick that her image had been used in such a way, sold to degenerates who in turn must have done some very unsavory things with them. But it's this last catfish story that I'll pass on to you that I think disturbs me the most. I ended up talking to a girl via a throwaway Skype account that I initially thought was actually trying to catfish me. Since she refused to provide any personal details about herself or any evidence that she was genuine. It would be pretty dumb of me to get catfished while investigating the subject itself, right? But as I was saying, I met a girl who claimed to be an actual catfish, or rather that... She had once partaken in the activity when she was much younger and internet chat rooms were still relatively new. She claimed to have met a young European man who was a few years older than her, and they had begun a kind of online relationship. They swapped pictures and things escalated from there until they eventually began a series of phone conversations from across the Atlantic. She had given a false name and said she suspected he had done the same since back then internet safety was something people worried about. As the relationship escalated, the European boy talked about flying over to the United States to meet her. There was only one problem. The girl had lied about her age. She was 15 at the time and had actually sent him a picture of a girl that was not her. In order to try to find a way out, she somehow convinced the boy that she had been in the car crash, had lost both her legs as a result, and was struggling with her memory. In short, she basically told him she had no memory of him, or of their conversations, and pretended that new girl, for want of a better term, had no interest in meeting a total stranger from Europe. The boy then went quiet. Now, I don't know how true this is, as the only piece of evidence she was able to provide was a newspaper article from a Belgium newspaper detailing about the man actually taking his life over that because of a breakup with an online girlfriend. She swore to me that it was the same young man, insisting it was his name, his pictures, the works. But as I said, I can't substantiate her claims due to her lack of willingness to identify herself. But if it is true, then that is a terrifyingly bleak result of such an affair. If not, then I wonder what kind of psychopath would fabricate such a detailed, disturbing story. Still, I hope these stories have given you some kind of insight into the techniques and protocols of those who wish to use the internet to deceive you. Practice internet safety, take everything with a pinch of salt, and be very, very careful with who you talk to online.
hopefully some of you dudes out there will learn a thing or two because this is less of a story than a straight up warning. I met this awesome girl in Tinder. We vibed for a few days, then arranged to meet up the following week. I wanted to impress her, so we arranged to uh, meet at a super fancy restaurant. She also hinted that she liked jewelry, so me being the generous soul that I am, bought her a fancy gold wrist tie thing. I forget the name of them, but it was expensive. So yeah, we arranged the date, and on the night of, I end up waiting outside the super fancy place in a shirt and tie, looking like Dwight from The Office or something. I just felt dumb. Anyway, I get a text from her saying she was going to be late and that she'd lost her bank card, so could I, like, cover her half of the bill? No worries, I think. So I walked to a nearby ATM to take out a little extra cash, as well as a generous tip for whatever server ended up serving us. Gotta show off that generous side, right? I walk back to the place, text her, and she says she's so sorry, but she's going to be even later than she first thought. Again, I'm like, no worries. She was way hot enough to wait for. She had this amazing smile, cute brown eyes, and from the gym selfies she put on her profile, you could see it from the front, if you know what I mean. Anyway, things start getting a little annoying when she texts me and she says she can't find the restaurant, and can I meet her further down the street so we can walk there together? Of course, I'm going to say yes. No way I'm going to just say no and walk back home. So, I do as I'm asked, and walk further down the street to a quieter part of the neighborhood in order to keep an eye out for her. A few minutes go by and there's still no sign of her. I'm starting to worry that she won't show, and I start getting that sinking feeling where I'm scared that I'm going to get stood up. But my eyes light up when I see her name on my phone, saying she's waiting in a nearby parking lot because she doesn't feel safe walking up to meet me alone. I got that. I totally did. She was probably wearing something super fancy, some sort of dress and heels, but I get to the parking lot and I start getting a bad feeling. It's super dark, pretty much deserted with only a few cars parked around the edges and it's actually way off from the main connecting roads so that walking into the place, I'd be pretty much alone and out of sight. But I'm thinking with my other head, you dig? So I can only really blame myself when that lily white meth head put a gun in my face. I thought it was just a random robbery at first, but when they demanded I turn over the jewelry, I knew what had happened. It was those guys, the whole time, that had completely catfished me, built me up, then smashed me down in the worst way possible. Not only was I down like $600 in cash and jewelry, but I had got it into my head that this girl, this totally fictional girl, was like the love of my life. I think that hurt more than just losing the money. You can get the money back, but not the self-worth, the self-esteem. So be careful out there, my guys. And be super, super careful when meeting strangers online. I think we can all agree that lockdown has been incredibly boring. I, a 24-year-old male, have been learning Italian. My mom is so proud since her people are Napolitano. Learning how to cook, working out a whole lot more, and, like many of you, dipping a toe into the local dating pool. My weapon of choice has been that relatively new dating app, Hinge. It's by far the best I've used since it seems to have an equal focus on look and personality. That dumb question's prompt might seem that way, but... They really give you an insight into a person's character. But anyway, I was having fun with it, just chatting with girls and playing a cool one until I matched with a girl who I won't name because I'm kind of worried she might read this. I know for a fact she's a Redditor, so forgive me if I just call her the girl. So the girl had some really cute pictures in her profile, as well as some really nice answers to the prompts. From what I could tell, she was into fitness, she was creative, a good sketch artist from her photos, and was very, very pretty. So obviously, I sent her a message complimenting her art and hoping that would draw her attention away from the thirstier guys who lack tack and sophistication. No offense, thirsty dudes, but you need to work on that. We get chatting for a while, and we have a lot in common. 
I was super excited about the prospect of meeting her, and obviously she felt the same about me, so the very next day, when she asked me to go for a walk around the local park with her, I jumped at the chance. I was kind of nervous waiting to meet her, doing that thing like rubbernecking, looking all around and hoping to see the gorgeous girl from the photos walking towards me. As I'm waiting, another girl walks up to where I'm sat near this water fountain, wearing shades and a baseball cap, and starts looking at me. I kind of look at her and give a look like, why are you staring at me? While she just smiles. Hi, Campbell, she says. And only then did the penny drop. The girl's pictures made her look clear-skinned, athletic, slender, and petite. With this girl, who was obviously the one I've been talking to, was the exact opposite. I don't want to be cruel. I won't say mean things about her, but she was not who she had made herself out to be. I had been thoroughly catfished. Like I said, I'm not a complete jerk. I did promise this girl a date, and a date I did give her. She did make it clear at one point that she had put on a little weight during quarantine, but she made no excuse for the heavy acne she had. I mean, I sympathize with skin problems because I had a little eczema myself, but maybe just be honest about it, you know? I'd have swiped anyway. But either way, we find ourselves a little spot among some trees and get chatting. It's only really then that I got annoyed at how she talked me up. She claimed to love sci-fi movies and stuff, but the more we talk, the more it was clear that she didn't know anything about the stuff that we talked about. She kept getting her Star Wars and Star Trek references mixed up, which was my first major clue, and it only got worse from there. After an hour or so of this, with me trying to stay as polite as physically possible, we agreed to walk back home, parting ways at a neutral point. We hugged. I said I'd see her again, which I felt guilty for lying, but... Hey, I was thoroughly annoyed at that point, and then we parted ways. Okay, so, you know people talk about getting like a gut feeling of being watched or followed? No idea what they're talking about, because as I walked home, fairly disappointed from what was a washout date, I got absolutely zero inclination that anything unusual was happening. I didn't feel eyes on me, I didn't get any like, sixth sense or gut feeling, I just walked home laid on the couch, and texted a buddy of mine telling him about the little dating disaster I just suffered through. He laughed, helped me see the funny side, told me how I should be flattered and that it meant I'd obviously hook up with someone else soon since I was a total ogre. The girl texts me asking if I wanted to meet again the next day, but I just sort of ignored the message. I know that's kind of low of me, but anyway... The next day, I'm just chilling playing Xbox when my phone buzzes with a message. Want to meet up in the park again? It was the girl. I told her some nonsense about being tired and too busy with work or whatever and that I'd drop her a message as soon as I was next free. She replies with the following. It's okay if you're tired. I can meet you at your place and we can chill in your apartment. I had absolutely zero memory of telling her where I lived. I didn't hint at it. I didn't clue her into any kind of location whatsoever. So how did she know where I lived? I don't remember telling you where my apartment building is, I reply. Don't worry about that. But she gives me a winky face. I'm smart, remember? I felt sick. There was only one solid explanation for why she knew where I lived. She had somehow followed me home without me spotting her, which... I'm sure I don't have to tell you why that was some serious line crossing a huge breach of trust for me. I left her on red and immediately called my ex to get her advice on it. She didn't pick up right away, but she called me back later in the afternoon as was quick to advise me to just block her, ghost her, and never look back. In her words, if she was this quick to get clingy and stalkerish, then there was only worse to come. So cut to like two weeks ago. It's late, I'm hungry, and I've ordered takeout delivery from the local taco place. I get a message from an unknown number, like, outside. That's all it said. So obviously, I go down to the front door of my apartment building, expecting to see a delivery driver with my order. We have a big solid door, no little windows, no peepholes, nothing like that. 
So I'm just all chill, excited to stuff my face with El Pastor. The door swings open, and it's the girl, and she looks livid. How dare you? You think you can just ghost me? You lied to me. Blah, blah, blah. I immediately freak out and just slam the door in her face. I run up to my apartment and lock the door behind me, but she wouldn't leave. Like it got to the point where one of my neighbors got into a confrontation with her because of the whole social distancing thing. In the end, they did me a huge favor and they called the cops. The girl gets a fine, advised to move along, which thankfully she does. But I'm so nervous she'll come back. Like really, really nervous to the point of terrified because if she's that unstable, she's likely to do me harm at one point, right? If you guys have any advice or experience in anything like this, please let me know. I'd be super appreciative of anything you can offer in terms of any sort of direction. So as you know, girls, dating can be super fun, but super risky. I'm sure you all have your guards up when meeting guys for the first time, especially when it comes to dating apps. And after one chance encounter with a guy I met on Tinder, I keep a double guard up these days, and here's why. I happened across the profile of a guy claiming to be a male model. The pictures were super hot. The guy looked like he was a Viking or something. Tall, blonde haired blue-eyed, a real-life Disney prince. Not just that, but he was incredibly charming, had all the right answers to all of my questions, and by the end of our first day chatting, I was so ready to meet him. So we arranged a little meet, a little cute thing at a local eatery, a Korean BBQ place that I've been dying to go to. Of course, he'd promised to pay for everything, and I'm not a freeloader, but let's just say that I like the gentlemanly touch. He was late. Now, I know that might seem irritating, but the anticipation of waiting for the guy was intoxicating. I didn't quite feel worthy of him, and being made to wait only compounded the feeling. By the time five minutes after our proposed meeting time had passed, I had serious butterflies in my stomach. I never anticipated what would come next, not in my wildest dreams. And when it did, I felt sick to my stomach. I look up from my phone to see someone recording me on their own device. This guy was no Viking. He was short, overweight, unshaven, and he looked like he hadn't bathed in weeks. I asked him what he thought he was doing filming me like that, and his response pretty much knocked the wind out of me. This wasn't exactly what was said, but just what I can recall from memory. You see? You see how unfair this is? You can pick up any guy you want, but I have to lie just to get you to meet me. That's disgusting. You should have been giving a guy like me a chance. You honestly think you deserve a male model. You're not even that hot. He's saying this so loud that the entire restaurant is looking around at us. I can feel all eyes staring at me. At us. It reminded me of the middle school play I had to perform in. The same one that had me running off the stage and puking in the girl's bathroom because I just couldn't handle the pressure with gross amounts of the tension. It was kind of weird what happened next. I mean, maybe I'd just grown up a whole lot. Maybe it was the fight-or-flight instinct that had me settling squarely on fight. But the words came out of me before I could even really consider them. I told him what he was doing was not okay, that lying was not the way to get a woman, and that he had a lot of maturing and growing to do before he could be in any decent place to pursue getting a girlfriend. I told him what he did was unfair, not what I was doing, that he should be ashamed of himself. And I totally turned it around. I was actually shaking with adrenaline, beaming with pride as someone in the back of the restaurant shouted something like, You tell him, girl. I gathered up my purse, got up from my seat, and walked past the guy without giving him a second look. Either this isn't as scary as a story to you guys as the obsessive stalker or the murderous incel, but for a few moments, it was the most terrifying experience of my life. Two thousand nineteen was probably the worst year of my life. I met a guy at a New Year's party in two thousand eighteen. You know, 
one of those kissed at midnight deals that has butterflies doing loop to loops in your stomach. He was tall, dark, handsome, every girl's dream. We swapped numbers, went on a few amazing dates, and after about a month of us hanging out and sleeping together, he asked me to be his girlfriend. Of course I said yes, how could I not? He was everything I ever wanted. But time has a funny way of proving you wrong, doesn't it? And if crystal balls existed and I had the capacity to peer into the murky fogs of one to see my future, I'd have never let him kiss me that night as the clocks ticked over to the new year. I'd have run a mile and never looked back. A few months into our relationship, his true nature came to the forefront. He was abusive, extremely abusive. It was all just verbal at first, telling me I was dumb when I got something wrong or said something incorrect. Then he got possessive, getting angry when I met up with or talked to my guy friends. He'd hide my phone, my car keys, my shoes, anything he could to control my behavior or movement. Then it was stuff like my diet. He was obsessed with making me lose weight, so like, I'd buy myself some sweet treats to enjoy after a long day of work, only to find them gone when I got home. Not just throw them in the trash, either. He'd ruin them utterly. I bought a carrot cake from a local organic bakery, and instead of just throw it out, he poured bleach or some kind of caustic cleaning fluid all over it in the sink. Like it was a pure power play. He didn't even try to be sneaky about it. Once he drove me to a gym near our apartment, told me to get out and not to come back until sundown. He expected me to work out for hours on end. I remember just sitting outside the place and crying until one of the trainers there took pity on me and drove me home. Big mistake. He beat the life out of me that night. He didn't just slap me around, I mean, he really beat me senseless. It started as soon as I walked through the door. He saw me getting out of a random guy's car and just lost it. He beat me in the TV room, followed me into the kitchen and slapped me there. Then I tried to hide in the bedroom. He kicked the door in and beat me unconscious. At least that's what I'm assuming happened. I woke up the next morning with blood on my pillow, still in that gym gear he made me buy. And I was too scared to go to the cops. I know they can be a great help these days, and the protocol for dealing with domestic abuse has improved dramatically, but I was just terrified. Eventually, things came to a head. After a particularly vicious argument over a dog, I said it was a good idea, and he blew his top. He put a gun to my temple and pulled the trigger. I think the worst part of the whole cycle was the apologies. I know that seems like a weird thing to say after telling you you almost shot me, but I'm serious. He was damaged, extremely damaged, and the crying and apologies after a fight always made me feel a deep sympathy for him. But enough was enough. I went out and bought him a bottle of liquor, then poured him drink after drink until he passed out comatose. He was full-on growl snoring as I packed a bag, got in my car and drove to my parents. There was a confrontation with my dad at one point, but the old man scared him off. I don't want to say why, as there's still an ongoing court case in the works involving brandishing a weapon, but yeah, it was over. About a month went by and I got myself a few dating apps to see if I could find someone new. It was nerve-wracking, it really was, but I found myself a couple of matches that really took my mind off the whole thing. It was the start of a long and arduous healing process, but at least I'd taken the step in the right direction. Both guys I'd match with were like my ideal partners. They seemed caring and kind, thoughtful and intelligent. One was awesome, but the other I was truly smitten with. He said something right, did everything right. He had this kind of fatherly vibe about him that made me think that maybe, just maybe one day, he'd be the right choice to start a family with. When it came time to meet for our first date, I was so excited. For the first time in months, I put on a nice dress, did my makeup perfectly, got my hair done, my nails done, the works. Somehow the guy knew I was into vegan food, or rather, that I wanted to turn vegan. My ex had categorically denied me that option, so the fact that this guy basically encouraged it was like a breath of fresh air. I took an Uber to the place, waited outside, and felt the butterflies doing backflips in my tummy again, just like they had done a long time before. That's when I saw him, walking down the sidewalk. People were giving him weird looks, darting out of his way and into stores or cafes. It wasn't the guy I'd met online. 
It was my ex, and he had a knife. I kicked off my expensive new heels and ran, hearing him scream after me as he chased me through the streets. I ran into a bar and begged the staff and security to help me. The big doorman was confused at first, but when he saw my ex tearing towards them with that knife in his hand, he shut and locked the door and the patrons inside. The cops came, he was arrested, and I got so many drinks bought for me that night. But seeing the whole torrid affair unravel before my eyes was just a nightmare. There was never any perfect fatherly guy I dream about. It was a complete fabrication of my ex. He knew me well enough to set up a fake profile that would attract my attention. I mean, he tailored it down to a T. He might have set up a few fake profiles, and I'm pretty sure the other guy was him too because after that night, I didn't get any more messages from him. But all he had to do was put them out there and wait for me to fall for it. Like the idiot I am. So a few years back, I found a shady corner of Reddit where people post adverts for partners to talk about illicit stuff with. For those that don't know, you know, some of those that don't, well, I imagine you're going to skip reading my post to find it. For those that do remain, well, this is my catfish story. I met with this awesome girl, swap a few messages with her, then get talking about the sweet stuff, if you know what I mean. It was awesome. I had such a good time and eventually it came to swapping pictures. She sent me pictures of some absolutely stunning model type girl who, to be fair, I should have been suspicious as things start to get a little heavier and we start swapping pics outside of our skivvies, if you know what I mean. This is the point I kind of lost my mind. I didn't realize how easy it is to get a hold of pictures of these girls online. Yeah, I know how dumb that sounds, but hear me out. These pictures were obviously taken at home, mirror selfies, stuff like that. For some reason, that convinced me she was real. So when she turns it around and asks me for ones of myself, I took some pictures and sent them to her without a second thought. We carry on swapping pictures and dirty texts for a while, and I eventually come clean about who I was. Like my real name, my job, not all the info, but a lot. She told me a fair bit about her too, which only made me like her more because she said that she was like a teacher and stuff. I liked the idea that she worked with kids, like it was a motherly thing that made my affection for her grow. But like a lot of stuff like that, she eventually started getting slower and slower with her replies, until they stopped dead one day. I was upset. I was super into this girl, but I get why she ghosted. A lot of girls on those subreddits do after a while, whether it's from shame or just boredom. One day they'll just disappear. So I kind of move on from her just get past the feeling of loss, I know that sounds dumb, and get on with my life. All until I get an email one day saying something along the lines of, we have compromising photographs of you. Wire $500 to the account below within 24 hours or the photographs will be sent to your family, place of work, and to local authorities. Attached to the email were copies of the pictures I'd sent to the girl, specifically the ones with out in the clothes on. I'd been really, really dumb. I'd not thought about the fact that you could basically ID me from the stuff in the background. I don't want to say what the pictures were exactly or how you identify me from them, but they were pretty compromising. I had no choice. I'd given the girl that I'd met, if it was even a girl at all, enough information to actually be able to send copies of these NSFW pictures to my employer, etc. So I paid it. I paid the money, and as you can imagine... That wasn't the end of it. I sent thousands of dollars to those scammers before I finally had the balls to say enough is enough. I emailed back telling them no, that they could send whatever they wanted to whoever they wanted, and that I'd just deny it or say that someone had hacked my phone. I deleted that account, started a new one, and got rid of my phone and got a new one. All kinds of things to try and put enough distance between me and the pictures I'd taken. And you know what? They didn't send anything to anyone. I expected my boss to call me telling I was fired like any day after that email exchange, but nothing came. I even asked my brother if he had any weird emails come through and he was just like, what? No, why? I was safe and they were bluffing. But please, learn from this dumb little story 
and don't ever, ever send stuff like that or anything of the such to people online. Not unless you want to send out thousands and hush money to some complete and utter psychos. This is the story of the worst thing that ever happened to me. This is the story of how a dream came true turned into a nightmare of how some of the sweetest moments of my life turned into the darkest, most humiliating experiences in my life so far. I'm only young, 19, and I know I have a lot of life to live ahead of me, but nothing, I don't think anything, will be quite as destructive to my psyche as what happened one summer when I was 16 years old. I used to play all-girl lacrosse in school. I noticed that in the U.S. it's like mostly a male sport, which is kind of crazy because over here in the U.K., at the school I went to, it was a girl sport. And like with the boys in the States, lacrosse can get really, really bloody and tense. Girls get their teeth knocked out with sticks sometimes, their knees smashed, their shins bruised up and down with horrible yellow-purple bruises. It really does get incredibly brutal sometimes. But I loved it. It was like the highlight of my entire week because I was good at it too. I made it on to the girls' first 11 toward the north of the UK playing different schools. We entered a tournament when I was 16, got all the way to the regional finals, and we actually won too. But it wasn't the perfect little story you might expect because something happened that ruined my entire school life. Scores are neck and neck in the final minutes. Adrenaline is surging. I'm so exhausted I feel like my lungs are about to explode and my thighs are killing me, but I keep going. I keep pushing. I remember stopping for a moment, feeling like I was about to throw up from the exertion, and I saw my big brother at pitch side. My ears were actually ringing. I felt like death warmed up, but the look in his eyes, like he was angry and proud and loving and supportive all at once, I couldn't hear him really. There were so many people shouting, but I kind of just knew. Don't give up, Rosie. Don't ever, ever, ever give up. And then all of a sudden, I could run again. I felt like I could run and run and never stop. The next thing I know, this pass came in from left field, bounces, I net it, burst forward and shoot. Only as I do, a defender kind of trips over my legs. I fall, she falls, but the ball hits home. The goalie had no bloody chance, it was like a freaking rocket. And that was that. We'd won. I'd won it for us. The entire game, the entire tour. I was the hero. The actual bloody hero. There was like 20 seconds of play left, but it was no good. There was no coming back for the other team. And when the final whistle went, it was like an explosion of happiness. Her coach ran on, hugged me, tears in his eyes, and that made me cry too. But the whole time this was going on, the girl that had fallen hadn't gotten up. The coach was fuming that we just carried the last part of the game on without seeing to her. She was rolling around in the dirt, and you could tell she was in loads of pain. Turns out she'd broken something. Actually, a pretty bad break, too, like she'd have a double-jointed thumb for the rest of her life. But I didn't care. I'm sorry, I know that sounds horrible, but I couldn't. The cross gets rough, and that's just how it is. So anyway, about a week later, I get this Facebook friend request. It's from this absolutely drop-dead gorgeous guy. I mean, he was like a heartthrob-level gorgeous. He was from a school on the other side of the city. I accepted the request, half out of curiosity, half so I could just fawn over the pictures of him on there. But then he drops me this message like, I saw you win that lacrosse game. I was there to watch my cousin play and I'd love to take you out sometime. You were absolutely amazing. Blah, blah, blah. I swear I blushed so hard I thought my face was about to burst. I tried to be cool about it, told him we should chat for a little bit first before we decided on anything. And we did. And it was lovely. He was such a nice guy. Not like a nice guy, but proper, actual, genuine. Point being, we chatted and ended up swapping some kind of raunchy photos. Now, I'm not stupid, or at least not too stupid, because I sent them and waited until I got the scene notification, then deleted them, so he could, like, see them, but not keep them. But then he just disappears. The Facebook account blocks me. The number on WhatsApp blocks me. He ghosted hard. I felt stupid, putting so much faith in this boy who just turned around and straight up blocked me, 
like I meant nothing to him. He had some really nice chats too about life, about school. He really seemed to just get me, but it was a lie because the next week in school, everyone was laughing, all the girls anyway, while loads of lads were like, all right, Rosie, how's it going? Up to much this weekend? I didn't get it at all, all this attention for some reason. Then I get told only my close mate had it in her to tell me what the deal was. Someone had sent all these underwear shots I'd taken and sent by Facebook boy to like everyone in our school, even my mates. They had come from some boy's account, one that had been deleted not long after. He hadn't blocked me, he straight up deleted them. It was horrible. I don't want to go into detail about what happened next, but it ended up with my parents getting called into school and within the space of about a fortnight, I go from the highest I'd ever been in my life to the absolute lowest. I ended up leaving that school to do my GCSE exam somewhere else, but I just couldn't focus. I failed them miserably, mainly because of the stress. The girl who broke her hand or whatever ended up sending me a message like, ha 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 ha, but nothing else. And it was only then I got the idea that it might have been her that orchestrated the whole thing. I ended up going on to a sixth form college that helped people reset their GCSEs. Weird setup, I know, but it gave me the space to be able to think properly and get over what had happened involving the photos. I passed them in the end and I got my life back on track. But the whole thing was just a knockout blow to that stage of my life. I was like a full year behind everyone else and that was super humiliating for a girl like me who had been a star pupil at one point. I feel a bit better having just written this whole thing out. I know it was dead long and I'm sorry, but if you take away anything from this and it helps you too, then I suppose it's been worth the effort. I can't tell you my name or where I live, nothing like that, because I did something terrible once, truly terrible, or maybe it wasn't so bad in the grand scheme of things, but when you consider the ending, it was bad, really bad, and I caused it all. When I was 19, I was broke, really broke, and I had expensive tastes. I was into drugs, expensive ones, powders and pills. No job to speak of. I mean, I made a little cash here and there doing favors for dealers, but that went straight into buying more. Eventually, I had a plan. I was going to catfish some. So I made a fake dating profile, backed it up with social media, the works. I picked a girl that wasn't, like, too hot, but was cute enough to be believable. I found some girl who posted on that Reddit group, R Gone Mild. This little thing with glasses and bangs... I might have fallen for it if I didn't know I was faking the whole thing. I then took to the dating apps, got myself a bunch of matches, and I'll hit them up with the same story. I lived a little away from them. I wanted to see them, but I just didn't have the money, explaining that I was broke. Which, as we know, was pretty much the truth. I asked them for enough money to buy a bus ticket or like a train ticket or whatever. Good for them. Most of them, they saw through it like straight away. Most guys just told me to buzz off, called me out on being a scammer or whatever. But one didn't. One actually was dumb enough to believe the whole thing. He was this dumb incel type from California. He sent $100 via Venmo to buy a ticket. But I didn't. I lied and told him he must have sent it to the wrong account. I made a new one, apologized, and promised it would work this time. And it did. He sent me another 100 bucks. But he said he wasn't a big earner and he couldn't really afford to send much more. Then came the really messed up part. I had a kind of breakdown and this guy was the only person I could really talk to about being an addict. I confessed everything. Not everything, but enough to tell him I was addicted to stuff and that I'd spent all of that money. So he sent me more. And I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't string this poor guy along for nothing, so... I broke off the whole thing, just made a clean break, deleted all the social media and just tried to get clean. It was horrible, truly one of the worst experiences of my life. But it only got worse. In the weeks that followed, I heard about something terrible that happened out in California. Again, I don't want to be too specific, but it was a very, very violent thing in which a lot of people died. And when I came to find out who it was that did it, 
I saw this guy's picture in the news. It was an old picture of him, but it was definitely him. Arrested for a mass murder charge or something. He blamed women. That's how I know it was my fault. And I'm really sorry. I'm just so, so sorry. I didn't mean for anyone to get hurt. I was just stupid and short-sighted and selfish. And I'm just so sorry. And I don't know if I can live with myself anymore.